We are into the last section of the book of Judges, and um, this is an odd uh, part of Judges because there are no more judges. The judges have disappeared, and so the story now is, I think what the author is doing is illustrating the depravity, the necessitated judges, and is setting up kind of the need for a king to bring the nation together. The key verses here, uh, verse 6, as Rick read for you, there's a, you're going to see this theme, verse 6, in those days Israel had no king, all the people did whatever seemed right in their own eyes. Start chapter 18, which we're also going to look at today, now in those days Israel had no king, and we infer from that that we should add and Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Chapter 19, now in those days Israel had no king. You got any idea here? There was a man from the tribe of Levi, but they did everything that they wanted to do. And then the book ends with these words, verse 25 of chapter 21. In those days Israel had no king. All the people did whatever seemed right in their own eyes. Now, I don't think that the argument here is that Israel needs a physical king. The argument is that Israel has abandoned its true king, which is the Lord. And we're going to see this illustrated. Today's story is, is weird. It's, it's uh, a little bit disturbing. Next week's is one of the most disturbing, um, profane passages we will ever look at. I think it's other than the crucifixion of Christ himself, it's probably the most disturbing passage in all of the Bible. So be forewarned. Anyhow, so today we have this story. Um, over in Deuteronomy chapter 12, Israel was actually told when they went into the promised land, they were supposed to do three things. Now, keep these three things in mind because we're going to see these guys just totally ignore them. Number one, they were to destroy the Canaanite worship centers. They were to go in and get rid of all the idols. Second, they were to establish a place where the tabernacle of God would be, where the, um, the place of offering would be, and everybody would move to that site. There would be a centralized place of worship. And at this point, it was placed in the land of Shiloh. And then finally, they were to refrain from building false places of worship and setting up false idols. So that's what they were told. This is your assignment as you go into Canaan. I want you to judge these people. I want you to destroy their stuff as well as them. And here's the new way that I want you to live. In this chapter, we're going to see that they ignore all three of those things. The story starts with the corruption of worship. There was a man named Micah or Mika who lived in the hill country of Ephraim, one day he said to his mother, I heard you place a curse on the person who stole 1,100 pieces of silver from you. Well, I have the money. I was the one who took it. So right away, what we learn about Micah is that he's a thief. Not only is he a thief, but he's somebody who stole from his own mom. And he, wasn't just, uh, he didn't just take $20 out of her wallet. He took a sizable sum from her. So right off the bat, we're thinking, there is something wrong with this guy. So he confesses. And then at the end of verse 2, here's mom's response. The Lord bless you for admitting it, his mother replied. He returned the money to her. She said, I now dedicate these silver coins. Remember how many of them there were? 1,100? I now dedicate these silver coins to the Lord in honor of my son. I will have an image carved and an idol cast. So when he returned the money to his mother, she took 200 silver coins and gave them to a silversmith who made them into an image and an idol. And these were placed in Micah's house. Micah set up a shrine for the idol. He made a sacred ephod and some household idols. He installed one of, the, one of his sons as his personal priest. So in, one, in the first five verses of the, the chapter... They've, they've ignored all three of these things. So mom, instead of saying, you know, bad boy, she says, oh, I'm going to celebrate. So now she tries to counteract the curse with a blessing. And instead of dedicating that money to the Lord, 
she decides they'll make an idol. There is a question here. What happened to the other 900 coins? Don't know. Maybe that was used for the shrine. Don't know. All it said is 200 silver coins are used here. So what we see right off the bat is Micah and his mom. Mom gives a curse, and she takes it back. She donates money to the Lord and takes it back. We see Micah, who builds a, he and his mom build a false shrine with a false idol, a false god, and then they establish a false priest. So they've, they're starting this whole new religion, and yet they feel really good about it. They, they're, they're, they're convinced that this is a good thing. Oh, won't God be pleased? No, he's not. What's happening here, and the fancy word here, that you may forget, but it's a good word. It's called syncretism. And the word syncretism simply means that you're taking, taking um, uh, the definitions there, trying to unify things that really don't go together and create something new. I call it buffet-style faith. The idea here, syncretism, and you see it in our world today. People say, well, I'm, I'm a... Christian Buddhist, or I'm a Muslim Christian. What does that mean? Those two cannot go together because they're contradictory. And when somebody says that, they're really saying that they're not either one of those things. They're just making stuff up. You hear today people all the time saying, well, I'm, I'm spiritual. Ooh. It means absolutely nothing in our world today. It can mean anything. So what happens is what people do is they imagine all these various doctrines and beliefs on a nice long buffet line. I realize if I keep going buffet line stuff, you guys are going to start getting hungry. But nice long buffet line, and, and you go through and you pick the things that you like. Oh, oh I, I, Jesus being the only way, no, I'll pass on that. And, but this, everybody goes to heaven, oh, I like that one. And so they, they create this designer religion. The problem is that there are thousands of these in the world because there can be as many as there are people. And that's what's happening here. They have this designer faith that they're coming up with, but the truth is that what it is, is it's, it's, it's a faith that's in brightly colored wrapping paper, but the box is empty. Okay? It's nothing. There is no real substance to it, even though it sounds good. So then we jump to verse 7, and we add another piece to the puzzle. One day a young Levite who had been living in Bethlehem and Judah arrived in the area. He had left Bethlehem in search of another place to live, and as he traveled, he came to the hill country of Ephraim, happened to stop at Micah's house as he was traveling through. Micah says, where are you from? I am a Levite from Bethlehem in Judah, and I'm looking for a place to live. Stay here with me, Micah said, and you can be my father and priest to me. I will give you ten pieces of silver a year, plus a change of clothes. One change of clothes per year? Anyhow, that's just me. And your food. The Levite agreed to this, and the young man became like one of Micah's sons. Now imagine what happens here. Micah goes in and talks to the son who's been established as the priest and says, You're out. I got a new guy. So the new guy comes in. Micah installed the Levite as his personal priest. He lived in Micah's house. I know the Lord will bless me now, Micah said, because I have a Levite serving as my priest. This passage is fraught with problems. Number one, Levites were set up to be keepers of the tabernacle, the place where God worked, where God was met, the true place of worship. So where, why is this guy here? The Levites also, because they were not given a particular tribe, were given 48 cities throughout Israel so that these guys would be scattered around and they could come to the tabernacle when their tour of duty. Neither one, none of those cities, was Bethlehem. So he's not living in a Levite city. 
He's not serving as Levites were supposed to do. And we say, what's going on? Most likely, what was happening was an erosion of the priesthood and the, the faith of Israel so that what's happening, basically, is this guy's out looking for a job. Hmm. They're looking for somebody who will bring a favorable message. This is troubling. Now we get to chapter 18, and we see that this guy wasn't as great as we thought he was. In verse 2, it says, so... Well, verse 1, Now in those days Israel had no king. The tribe of Dan, one of the twelve tribes, was trying to find a place where they could settle. For they had not yet moved into the land assigned to them when the land was divided among the tribes of Israel. And we say, why not? So the men of Dan chose from their clans five capable warriors from the towns of Zorah and Eshdael to scout out the land for them to settle in. When these warriors arrived in the hill country of Ephraim, they came to Micah's house, spent the night there, hospitality. While at Micah's house, they recognized the young Levite's accent. And so they went over and asked him, Who brought you here? Why are you, what are you doing in this place? Why are you here? He told them about his agreement with Micah. You know, I get a little bit of money and a change of clothes, and they feed me. And they say, ask God whether or not our journey will be successful. Go in peace, the priest replied, for the Lord is watching over your journey. See, this whole ephod thing, that was a, a, an item that was supposed to allow you to discern the will of God. So that's what he uses. So the five men went on to the town of Laish, where they noticed the people living carefree lives like the Sidonians. They were peaceful and secure. The people were also wealthy because their land was very fertile and they lived a great distance from Sidon and had no allies nearby. So what happens here is that these guys show up from Dan. They haven't done their job. They were told to go in. Here's the land that you're given. You go in and you get rid of all the people that are living there, and you take the land. That's God's commission to you. Yeah, they didn't feel like it. They thought it would be too tough. So the people of Dan were actually cramped crammed into this one little bitty city, and it was getting a little bit overcrowded. So they need to find another city to live in. So they're out, and they're finding out who they can defeat and take over the land. On the way, they stop at the house here, stay the night. It's the closest thing they had to a holiday inn, I suppose. And so they stay. Their hospitality is accorded. They go on. They find this town. And, and listen to what they said about it. It was carefree peaceful, wealthy, it was fertile, and you know what was best about it? It was isolated. So nobody could come and help them. And they go back to their friends, and they say, you know what? We got just the place for us to move into. So they get an army of 600, and they come back, and they say, we're going to take this last town, and we're going to call it the city of Dan. But on the way, they stop at Micah's house. And while the 600 guys are standing out at the entrance to the property, the five guys go in. This time, they take the shrine, they take the idol, they take the ephod. Basically, they're taking their religion. And when the Levite says, hey, what are you doing? They take him too. And basically, what they say to him was, hey, you want a better job? We'll give you more money, we'll give you more sets of clothes, and you will have a congregation that's bigger than this measly congregation. So you come to us and you can, you can be the priest for the entire tribe. And the guy says, ho oh, ho, you bet, I'm in. Hmm, he's moving up the ladder. This is troubling. Over in 1824, Micah finds out that these guys have stolen all his stuff, and he chases them with his men. And when the men of Dan find him, they, they see him coming, they say to them, why are you chasing us? Why have you called this men, these men together to chase us? And this is what Micah says. What do you mean, what's the matter? You've taken away all the gods I have made and my priest, and I have nothing left. And their response is, 
you better be careful what you say next, buddy, because we got some trigger-happy people in our group. And Micah realizes he can't fight these guys. And he turns and goes home without his God, without his place of worship, without his priest. Tim Keller has a, um, a, a good statement on this. And what Keller writes is this. In the end, self-made religion will disappoint. Whatever we make into our God, money, power, relationships, or even a reduced man-made version of the biblical God, it will not deliver. The person who makes a career their God will eventually find their route to blessing blocked by someone who is too strong, too able, too well-connected, too lucky for them. The person who makes their image their God will find time and enemy too strong for them to hang on to their youth and good looks. Ultimately, death removes all the false gods we look to for blessing. Micah was actually blessed in that he discovered the emptiness of his God before he died when it was too late. It is a great reminder that everyone is a worshiper. The only question is who or what is the thing we look for to for ultimate meaning and purpose and blessing? What is the thing about which, if it were taken away from us, we would say, you took my God, what else do I have? Where can I go in life now? I have nothing left. There is only one God who will never be taken away from us. He is the one whom we can say with Peter, to whom shall we go? You have the words of life. There's one surprising twist at the end of this. Over in uh, verse 30, after they get back to Dan, they've, they've, they've defeated this town, they've wiped out Laish, now they've appropriated it for themselves. And it says they set up the carved image. They appointed Jonathan, son of Gershom, son of Moses, as their priest. So this Levite, apparently was a, a grandchild of Moses. It could have been a grandchild, a great-grandchild, but, but it's a descendant of Moses. And isn't that troubling? Because the lawgiver, his family has now somebody in it who is leading people completely away from the law. And it reminds us that faith can be lost in just a single generation. It was uh, D.A. Carson who writes, um, let me see if I've got it here, one generation knows the gospel, the next assumes it, and the third loses it. <clears throat> We've said many times that there are no such thing as grandchildren in heaven. That doesn't mean your grandchildren don't go to heaven, but it means that every generation must come to a first-hand realization of the gospel that you don't get it just because your parents had it. My parents are Christians. I'm a Christian. See, it, 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 it erodes generation after generation unless something is done to make it real and personal for every single generation. Let's admit, this is just a goofy passage. We go, what, what are we supposed to learn from this? Well, a couple of things I want to suggest to you. Number one, I think what we see is that it is possible to maintain outward devotion to the Lord while still drifting from the faith. It's possible to be very religious and yet still not be a follower, still not be going in the right direction. I made a little bit of a, a, a list here. We hear it all the time from people. The average person will tell you that they believe in God but if you ask these people what God they believed in, their, their definitions would vary widely because it's not the true God. We hear people say things like this, my God isn't like that. Or I'm a very spiritual person. Or I believe all religions contain some truth, which sounds wonderful, but most of that truth contradicts each other. I like to think of God like, I know the Bible says it's wrong, but I prayed about it, and I've got a peace about this. 
See, the problem is that we can define God however we want, but unless it's the God who is, all we're doing is creating a God of our own imagination. That's what's happening in our society. We see it all over the place. Lots of people talk about, oh, and I want to thank God. Who is this God you're thanking? Is he the God of the Scriptures? Is he the God that's holy? Is he the God that's just? Is he the God who has sent Jesus to die for his people? If not, this is a false God, an empty God, a God that is created in our mind. It's a figment of our imagination. It's a God who can't save anybody problem here. It is a real problem here. We, um, we live at this time where there's a lot of churches who will say, well, we're changing the way we worship because we want to be more relevant. Or we want people to get a better experience out of worship. And, and all these, these things that turn worship from focusing on God to focusing on the consumer. And if our worship is focusing on the consumer, who's the God? It becomes us. If we're worshiping us and how we feel and what we get out of it, we aren't worshiping at all. But we feel good about it because we've been to church. Second, I hope you see the power of one person. What would have happened if mom had handled things differently? What if mom had not catered to her son? What if she had said, why would you do this instead of rewarding him? You know, it's kind of like saying, so, you stole my retirement funds, huh? Well, you gave them back, so now I'm going to buy you a car. That's insane what she did. What would have happened if Micah, instead of feeling self-righteous, had truly repented? What if he had come before the Lord and said, Lord, I, I, I deserve the curse. I do. Please, please forgive me. Instead, he creates his own religion. What if the Levite had stood up for what he had been called to do and said, I can't. I can't serve as your priest. I can't can't be a party to this sham of a religion. What would have happened? The Apostle Paul um, talks in a couple of the books of the Bible about stumbling blocks and the difference that one person can make. We can cause other people to be led to the Lord or we can cause other people to be led away from the Lord. Think about the power of one person, the power of Winston Churchill, Thomas Jefferson, Gandhi, Hitler, Karl Marx, Sigmund Freud. One person can make a huge difference. So here's the question. Why can't that one person be you? How do we, how do we turn our society away from racing madly towards the cliff of destruction. It's going to take people who are willing to stand with the Lord. Why not you? Why can't that one person be you? God says it's our job to fight compromise in our own life. Instead of whining about the society, maybe we ought to do something about correcting things in our own life. You know, you probably missed this at the very end of this passage. Verse verse 30, it says, Everyone who saw it um, said, that's that's the wrong chapter, chapter 18, it says, So Micah carved an image, and it was worshipped by the tribe of Dan as long as the tabernacle of God remained at Shiloh. Shiloh was um, not very far away. I mean, it was really in close proximity to where these people were. And the point is this, that God was not hiding. He was not difficult to find. 
And yet Micah, the Levites, and all these other people decided instead of worshiping the true God, they would create a statue and call it God. The Lord was near, and they turned away. If they were interviewed today, they would tell you that they had a new vision. They started this new religion. They may scatter some Bible verses around. Maybe they'll hit you on the head with the Bible and say, you are, you're narrow-minded. The truth is, when we try to fix things, we are moving away from Shiloh. God has already declared his purpose. God has already told us where he was. He's already told us how to find him. Unfortunately, no one seems to know where he is. So here's the real question. Are you serving the real God or are you serving a God that you got at the buffet table? Do you dismiss some of God's commands or some of God's characteristics because you don't like them, because they don't fit your style? Are you uncomfortable with some of the Christian doctrines? Do you just dismiss them and make up doctrines of your own? Are you motivated by fancy gimmicks or slick programs, or are you impassioned by the Lord who has revealed himself and sent his Son to save us? If you feel you can't find God, take heart. He's not far away. Shiloh is very, very close. Cry out to him. See how wonderful and beautiful he is. Then, without being distracted by those around you, even people who call themselves Christians. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. He is our delight. He is our wisdom. He's our reason for laughter. He's our reason for gratitude. Anything else is just from the buffet table, and it will lead you straight to hell. So let's pray together. Father, first of all, we want to tell you that we're not too crazy about stories like this in the Bible. But the truth is, sometimes we don't like them because they resemble what's going on in our own lives. Sometimes, Lord, we're tempted to try to make you more relevant, to try to make the Christian faith more palatable. And by doing so, we, in essence, deny that faith. So, Father, help us to see where we are drifting and draw us back to you. Give us courage to stand on what is true instead of falling for what is novel. And, Lord, we pray for our country, for our world, for our friends, for our neighbors who are whistling as they head down the road to hell, thinking they're just fine, that the God that they believe in would never, ever judge them. Lord, please, before it's too late, help them to see that that God is really no God at all. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for staying close. Thank you for not hiding. Please reveal yourself to us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.